Hello, everyone. Welcome to NSS CaveNAR, NSS webinar, CaveNet. And um, tonight we have an awesome speaker, which will be Beth Cartwright. She's doing her second um, part of the webinar that she started on the Grand Canyon Caves, which is really incredible. She's been back there again. But first, I want to thank our sponsors, which is the NSS and um, Edwards Aquifer Authority. Thank them for uh, their keeping us going all these years. And um, I'm Debbie Smooth. I'm the webinar chairman. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Beth. Um, for those of you that have not seen part two, part one, sorry, please go to the NSS website of caves.org and pull up part one. It will help help you understand what's going on in this half because she did an excellent, excellent webinar um, for us just a, um, a few weeks ago. I guess it's been a couple of months ago now. But if you would do that, that would that would help greatly. But um, let's start with how awesome Beth is. She does huge amounts of um, caving. I see her all over the place on all kinds of videos with all the amazing stuff that she does. And so she's a, a very uh, prolific caver. Uh, but Beth has been caving since she was 11 years old. She began exploring underground while attending college and primarily caved in South Central Kentucky where she learned to survey. Now, during this time, Beth got involved um, with a group surveying in collaboration with uh, archeologists at Mayan sites in the Yucatan in Mexico. That sounds pretty interesting. Through her adventures with the caving group in Kentucky and Mexico, Beth is invited to a week-long expedition in Lechaguilla, the caver's holy grail. Um, and she's also been to, um, working in Carlsbad Caverns in 2011. Um, Beth has since returned to Lechaguilla many times and many other New Mexico caves as well um, and for many day trips and expeditions. Now, Beth was um, a participant in the expedition to Montana's Bob Marshall Wilderness and also the Grand Canyon, which you can talk about tonight, which is amazing. She's going to tell you how far they pushed this um, cave. It's stunning how, what they've done. So I'm going to um, go ahead and get this um, turned over to her. Let me, okay, Beth, you want to unmute yourself? So there you go. Unmute yourself so that you can come on. Awesome. All right, Beth, go ahead and take over. All right. Can everybody, can you hear me okay, Debbie? Yep, I hear you great. Awesome. Okay. All right. And you see the screen there. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, thank you again, Debbie. Um, hello, everyone, and, and thanks for tuning in. I'm happy to be back. Tonight, I'm going to tell just a few stories about uh, the most recent expeditions into Double Bopper Cave. In, it's in the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. And here's the group picture from the October 2018 expedition. As you can see, we are quite happy to have um, mapped enough of enough new cave passages in Double Bopper Cave during that trip uh, to make the cave over 40 miles. There's really never a dull moment with this crew, so I'm excited to share it with you all. Now, before I start into this year, I just wanted to give a quick background, some context, uh, and just some of the highlights uh, in case anyone hasn't watched that last webinar that I gave in August 2018. If, uh, if you'd like to hear more of the history of the project, I, I do encourage you again to listen to the recording of that webinar on the NSS website. Okay, so very quickly, uh, cave exploration in this particular area began in 2006, and in less than 10 years, um, they had mapped over 45 miles of cave passages. The crowning jewel, if you will, of this area is, is called Double Bopper Cave, and it's known for its long length, uh, as well as what's found inside including these amaz amazing zip gypsum formations and salt formations and, and thousands of mummified bats and other mammals. Now, if you fast forward to just about two years ago when connections were found um, linking Double Bopper with, the two other cave with two other caves in the area called Bottom Bopper Cave and Gryffindor Cave, that brought us up to uh, 
to about where what I talked about um, a couple months ago. And and that really that brings us to last year. So in the fall of 2018, teams continued surveying in the caves in the area of Double Bopper, and we were we were mostly surveying internal passages in Double Bopper Cave. Uh, there were a few small breakouts, but not as not as much, not as huge as in years past. Uh, the previously unexplored portions of the cave were getting noticeably smaller, uh, but by no means are they any less impressive. Our efforts have brought Double Bopper Cave system to 40.6 miles. Uh, in the area where Double Bopper is located, there are now 60 miles of known cave passages, and that helps the park be able to boast over 73 miles of mapped caves. Uh, each of the past few years, we've been doing excuse me, two, uh, two larger expeditions to this area because the two main entrances to the system are located in adjacent canyons with a huge mesa in between them, a 1,500-foot tall mesa in between these two entrances. So you can see the appeal of these multiple trips. Uh, I'll talk about October versus September trips. <laughs> but so during, you know, during one week uh, in September, the teams will camp outside the original main big double bopper entrance and survey leads closest to that side. And a few, le few weeks later, uh, another group comes out and camps outside the Gryffindor entrance and has survey goals over there. All right, so those are the, a few of the very basic logistics of expeditions to the area. But, you know, what comes of it? What, why do we do this? Well, here's one of the main reasons we do what we do. This is a very small portion of the map of Double Bopper Cave. It's drawn by cartographer Stan Allison, and he draws it using sketches made in cave by many talented sketchers. This is very important documentation of a, a hugely significant resource in the Grand Canyon National Park. And if anyone's unfamiliar with cave maps, uh, I thought it would be interesting to show you kind of some of the details. We're going to sort of zoom in to this small section of cave in the blue box there. So here it is a little bit closer. And then as you zoom in, you you get into that little blue rectangle and you, you start to see the, the details, that you see the, the travel route is marked. It's, it's exactly where the flag trail is located inside the cave. Uh, a climb is marked at the bottom to note the lead. And it shows slopes on the floor. It shows uh, ceiling features, pits and domes. And of course, the most important formation areas and, and some of the mummified creatures of note. We just we, we include as much detail as we can to to accurate, accurately depict the cave. So Stan was drafting the double buffer map, but then, meanwhile, Gryffindor Cave was discovered in a, in an adjacent canyon. Paul Berger is the cartographer for Gryffindor Cave, and he had actually drafted a large portion of this cave before it was even known that it connected to double buffer. On here, you see the detailed points, you know, um, where it's all filled in with, with detail. And then the top left there is, uh, those are line plots. Those are actually line plots from Double Bopper Cave. You can see how close they come and, and uh, they, they connect in actually just one area. So I'll do another zoom into that blue box. Here you can start to see some named passages and then Finally, we'll get to the detailed look. This room is called the Lunar Station. I, I can remember standing on the rock in the middle of this room and looking into six giant leads all like down the, down the slope all around us, each of them 50 to 100 feet wide, and saying in total disbelief, that's, that's a lead? And and that's a lead, and and over there, that, like these these huge huge passages, um, you know, the first year that we were we really made a push to to uh, map this area, it was it was hard to wrap my head around, and when I see this part of the map, those memories come back, and I I get excited about how much we've accomplished, and 
the opportunities that we've had to see what no one even knew existed. It's really only possible with the help of supremely talented sketchers, cartographers, and photographers that that I'm even able to talk to you about this today. Okay, so now that you know the layout of the area, I'll, I'll start telling you um, the story of this most recent expedition. Our story begins, as, as it always does, on the surface, where we carry these insanely heavy packs down from the Grand Canyon Rim. Uh, we lose about 3,000 feet of elevation in less than a mile on essentially no trail. The, in the, the left-hand photo there, you can see a cluster of people up on the slope. They're, they're making their way past the spot where you have to down climb. So I was waiting, I took out my phone and, and took some photos, and then, and then I turned around and snapped this photo on the right of Garrett and Andrew. And they're heading down into the canyon where there's no trail, it's just spiky plants and rocks. There are a few places uh, on the way down to camp where we have to lower our packs and down climb. We use webbing usually as a handline. Uh, the route to the main double bopper cave entrance in the adjacent canyon is, uh, it, it actually involves one vertical rappel. So we leave our vertical gear close to the top of our pack so we can access it quick and, and get past that spot. Um, our camp is down in that canyon in the lower left of this photo but we zigzag so much uh, to avoid cliffs on our way down there. It takes a really long time. It, it, you know, almost the entire time it looks like it's right there, and yet you are still hours and hours away from camp. As we were descending, those clouds up there just kept getting darker. Uh, but we stayed dry on the hike in. Uh, it, it started to rain soon after we got to camp. All right, and I apologize for the blurriness on this and, and the next photo. Um, it's, it's actually a still image from a GoPro video, but I wanted to include it just so you get an idea of the layout of our camp. Uh, at this point, we had just gotten our tent set up just in time. It's, it's off to my right on a, on a platform, and, and I'm standing in the middle of a major canyon drainage. It's usually very dry, uh, but you can see right here in the middle, there's a, there's a puddle forming in the low spot by those two boulders. You can also just see James in the top right corner, sitting back in that dark area. He's, he's taking shelter from the rain underneath a big boulder. So I want you to remember those, those two big rocks near, near the puddle in the middle, because here they are again. It, uh, it started raining harder. And then it was thundering, and it was an, it's, it's an eerie, rolling thunder when you hear it from down in the canyon that, that echoes off the canyon walls. And soon after that started, a flood front came just blasting through our camp. And it was never very large, but, but uh, still <laughs> rather intimidating. And for the 20 plus years that cavers have been coming to this area, it has very rarely rained during the fall expeditions and, and never like this. That's why we usually go in the fall because you know it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and it's super dry. In fact, we're, we're usually worried about collecting enough water from, from the seeps coming out of the canyon walls to, to make it through the week and have enough water. Not so this time. <laughs> Most days during this particular trip, that, uh, that rock shelter back there was about the only dry place you could find. A few, a few tent floors um, succumbed to the days of rain and people's stuff got soaked. Uh, one person's bivy sack was pretty much unusable. But we, we didn't, thankfully, we didn't lose any equipment over the edge. Uh, that was definitely the most concerning part that, you know, if the water got high enough and swept away any gear, it had just a few hundred feet to get stuck on some branches or, or swirl around in an eddy before it went over the 400 foot cliff. Uh, at the time that first flood happened, the first flash flood happened, we actually had a team on the edge of the rim 
they were they were rigging the ropes to get into the cave and one person was even on rope part way down the cliff when when that first flood front um hurtled over the cliff edge thankfully the ropes are rigged off, rigged off to the side of the main drainage so we didn't have to repel and ascend directly in a waterfall most of the days um we woke up to a scene kind of like this uh was looking up from I think from our tent actually uh, the the clouds would be building into rainstorms you know up high and and a sort of misty fog would just sink into the canyon it was totally surreal as as I said the acoustics in the canyon changed dramatically with the humid air and and thunder was just like nothing I've ever heard before then uh when the heavier rains came we could we could look up on these cliffs and see smaller waterfalls coming off the cliffs above and there were there were dozens of them that we could see and they're all feeding into this drainage where we were camped so uh as you might imagine our our morning routines were often hastened by the fact that there's a very dry cave about 200 feet below us and that's where we're headed uh, our camp is is just up that canyon a little way if there was a, a break in the rain in the morning I would shove everything in the tent or underneath that rock shelter and head for the ropes here's uh, Paul getting ready to go over the edge as as the canyon sort of filled with clouds up there in the back and and the rain sort of made everything that dark green dark red something you don't commonly see in the desert southwest. So except for that top bit where Paul was, the ropes actually stayed fairly dry. Um, here's a photo of Andrew on rope during a particularly dry spell. And it was a neat experience to see the canyon in both these dry and really rainy conditions. Something we, you know, a lot of us have never seen before. And then here's sort of the wet version of that same photo. You can see the lighter colored wall near the ropes. That's where it's staying dry under the overhang. And, or, you know, a lot drier than the the wall across the canyon or, or right by the waterfall there. You can see the waterfall just to Andrew's right. That's that's all the water that had just traveled past our camp. So I think every day we, we would get on rope and look down and say, no, there's, there's no tents down there. Okay. I think I think we're good. <laughs> Just wondering what had happened during the day. I was, you know, I was amazed um, a couple times during the week uh, at how quickly everything dried up after a flood event. Here we are with a another dry version versus a wet version of sort of, of the same uh, viewpoint. We had, we really saw firsthand that that textbook definition of flash floods in the desert southwest. But we did, so we did see a few clear mornings. It uh, cleared up, I think, a day during the week. <laughs> here's uh, here's Andrew and Steven on rope. They're uh, they're getting ready to lock off their rappel devices and navigate what's called a J-hang into the entrance. They uh, they looked so content sitting there that I had to put next a, a picture of them. Excuse me, sort of flail, flailing about as they make their way across that space between them and the cave. Once they're inside, it gets it gets a lot easier because if you don't include the couple relays near the rim, that 200 foot drop, and the J hang into the entrance, there's almost no vertical necessary inside Double Bopper Cave System. So once we get into the entrance, we hang a clothesline. Our all our vertical gear can can stay right there until it's time to climb back out and up to camp. In the past, we would hang our vertical, hang our harnesses on the on the cord, mostly to keep our keep like the critters away from our precious vertical gear. This year, it really did kind of become a clothesline uh, with rain jackets and rain pants and extra layers and other items that that people just needed to dry out because that sure wasn't happening on the surface. Okay, so now I sort of brought you inside, right? The exciting part. Um, Double Bopper Cave has just countless treasures, but 
I had to I had to organize them somehow, right? Which is really hard. It, there's so much in there. Um, so here are the some of the most notable ones that that we came across this past year. We we mapped more big boreholes and also found some really interesting shapes. You'll see what I mean by that shortly. They're they're very unique formations, and they're made of salt and gypsum and iron. And geez, there's lots of them. There's we we found more mummified mammals that just these, these things continue to impress and confuse me. Um, and then lastly, there's just there's not much water, uh, at least not in the cave. <laughs> Double Bopper Cave is is very dry. It's it's actually at about 40% humidity. Okay, so here we're gonna start. We're gonna um, start with some of these big boreholes. Uh, there was a passage called the Me Monster that was mapped in 2017, and an extension was found to that borehole uh, in 2018. And here's a part of that passage. I'll actually show a few photos from this area. Uh, this is Stephen's picture, and then in the next slide, you'll see you'll see Stephen actually taking that picture. Uh, we took some time on this particular day to, to photo document some interesting new areas that had been found by teams during the week. And here we are. James took this photo of Stephen taking a photo. They, they're using the same flashes, and they did this on multiple shots to, to show sort of the context and, and the cave photography process. And it just it turned out really neat. The, the ceiling in this borehole was so angular. And then there's there's other areas in the cave where uh, where the walls are sort of more pocketed, the the ceiling the ceiling is more rounded, I guess, and and so this is a nice um nice passage off the main route. And and then um here's another borehole uh or another borehole view. Um this is a rather wide, not very tall borehole. It's uh, it's about 80 feet wide, and I'll show more photos of those hair-like white formations on the left very soon. This is this is sort of just that wider view to show the perspective and and the location of that formation in the passage. But I promise I will show more close-up pictures of it later of that formation later when we get to the formation photos. All right, here's another photo in one of the wider spots in the main passage. I really love this photo because it reminds me of all the scrambling and rock hopping that you get to do traveling through these caves. It was extremely tiring and yet so satisfying traveling through rooms like this. This is actually near that, that lunar station room that I showed on the map. All right, on to that, the second sort of category. Um, this is this is what I called interesting shapes <laughs> because as, go, as I was going through the photos, I, I kept seeing these really just odd and interesting shapes and maybe I should say, actually say interestingly shaped passages. Here we are surveying kind of a slightly pancakey route uh, with this nice ceiling channel going through the middle. And this spot had many, many side passages leading off of it. Actually, right in front of me on that that rock that's uh, sticking up, before my backpack sitting there, um, that's we put a survey station there, right in the middle because uh, this was a six-way junction. There were there were passages going off everywhere. <laughs> I also love the the color difference between the floor and the ceiling. Here's uh, here's another pancake passage but a little bit shorter. You can see we can't quite stand up yet uh, or anymore. <laughs> We're sitting there surveying or finishing up sketches and survey. Uh, it's, it still has that great contrast between the floor and the ceiling. And on the ceiling, I want to point out that there's these fist-sized rocks, or I guess they're called inclusions, that are hanging down. We even used one of the inclusions as, as a survey station up there in the top right corner. The, the floor here is made of made of iron foam, and when you touch it, it turns into a cloud. 
that rises up from the floor and gets in your nose and on all of your stuff and turns it all the dark, dark red, or kind of brick red. Uh, it actually it actually becomes a breathing issue, and uh, and many of the leads left in Double Bopper Cave are low crawls with this material on the floor. So they're going to require really good dust masks uh, for for further exploration. In great contrast, we we also have floors made of bright white salt-based minerals. I I love this snowball like floor there's there's a salt formation in by the person in the back and i i put this in the interesting shape category because uh because of that awesome shaped passage going off behind him it's also a good sort of action shot of cavers working on survey either sketching or taking inventory uh okay so double bopper cave is is known for passages like this one. The walls are completely covered by gypsum flowers, and I know that's formations, right? We'll get to that later. But I wanted to include this one because of the bell shape of the passage. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time in this. This was one of those connecting passages, an, an internal passage connecting two main branches. Um, and here it is from a slightly different angle. The uh, just the erosion processes combined with so many flowers is just mind blowing. So we were in this in this uh, passage for a while and, and nearby passages, and uh, a little further down, we got, it got a little tighter, and we had to be a lot more careful about our surroundings. It was still walkable, still um, uh, you know standing up height, but. And and uh, and also still that sort of belled out bottom near the floor. Here, uh, Robin and I are obviously very busy uh, modeling, while while Jason was working hard planning our next survey goals, or rather, maybe he was just trying to stay out of the way of the flash. I don't know, um, but it looks like he's taking a little nap. Uh, this is one area where, uh, sorry, this is another area where we got into. The, the iron foam. In this next photo, our, our trail is pretty obvious. We we try not to deviate from it wherever we, whenever possible, because wherever we stepped in these areas, the dust would move around and we would sink into those iron-based sediments. So you can see everywhere that we haven't stepped is dust-colored. It's uh, it's the yeah, color of the rock and the ceiling, and and then. Right where we've stepped, uh, it turns that brick red because we're we're breaking down or we're moving the dust away, breaking down through the iron foam and scattering it. There are some more uh, climby portions that we that we got to survey. Here I am making my way down after after we had surveyed up this slope, and I uh, I remember I think it was a dead end up there, but uh, so we turned around and came back, and uh, this this climb was definitely sort of sporty um there were the, the the bottom was kind of pea sized gravel and it was just a chute and then there were there were mummified bats on the walls that you to so places where you can't you put your hand or feet uh and the the photos here just show off another kind of cool shape it's uh it's sort of that tall and skinny rift like shape it's really neat all right, I'll just show one more interesting passage shape photo that shows some more variety in the cave. It this one almost looks like a like it's shattered and and there's sort of a spiral coming out of the darkness of the passage beyond where where this guy's standing. This is also a very interesting spot because there are uh, there are large cave pearls in the area and you can you can just see the kind of the the white versus the yellow at the bottom of the photo. So the large cave pearls are, are formed by dripping water. And it's just so interesting because they formed right next to these salt formations that if they got hit by water, they they dissolve. So oh, it's just, they're, they're right next to each other. And, and I'll show photos of those, uh, or a photo of the uh, cave pearl later. And here we are in the, the formations category. Uh, 
we're we're back in the passage where Jason was lounging under that ledge on the left. This this spot is is one of many, and this this group of gypsum flowers went on like this for hundreds of feet. Even having seen it, having been there, excuse me, it's it's hard to imagine so many gypsum flowers, so dense, and covering such a large area, just nonstop. And you know, they're all they're all unique. Um, there there are zigzags and and curly cues. Uh, I found ones that looked like horns, and there's just giant ones that look like swords coming out of the wall. Uh, there are some broken ones that that hang on to others because of the way that they fell. And in some areas, in, the, well, in lots of these areas, the ground is just completely covered in fallen gypsum and flowers. They, like I said, they, they vary. They're all unique. They they vary in shape and size. There, this one I found was a perfect spiral. It's uh, it's about five inches across and sticking out from the wall, maybe another five inches. It's it's completely possible that just in one small area here, you could you could spend days or even weeks photographing different gypsum flowers. Okay, here's the cave pearl I was talking about. Um, it's this is amazing. It's the, it's the size of a goose egg, and this wasn't discovered this past year. But Stephen took some more very nice photos of the, of this unique formation. It's particularly unique in Double Dopper Cave. You see, um, cave pearls are more common in other caves around the world, but but Double Bopper has very few calcite formations like this one due to the, the lack of drip, dripping water. Uh, so let me let me show you just a kind of polar opposite. You know, I was saying that that water would dissolve salt formation. So so, but it it forms that the calcite formations like that cave pearl. This room is called the, the White Smoke Forest. Uh, most of the formations are, are salt-based, and it's just so bright in this room. Your light bounces off of all of this, these bright white colors, and it, it, it's so bright to just be in this room. I'm, I'm sure it was hard to get the flashes just right because it, it blows out the, the sections of the photograph where it hits the walls. Not to mention, it's it's really hard to travel through this area because, uh, you know, it's it's just such an extremely delicate formation area. Uh, the salt formations, they they look very different from uh, they look very different from calcite formations, uh, and it just it gives this room an eerie appearance uh, compared to. You know, what you would think of as typical cave formations that are that are calcite based. Now, um, I put this next picture in here because uh, I wanted I wanted to go back to this one and, and just I want to no note a few things. Uh, first, not all of the cave is absolutely covered in gypsum flowers. I know that <laughs> that's most of the photos and uh, and that's what we focus on, but but actually, a lot of the cave is like this. It's um, a lot of the passages are large with these really large dusty boulders that you have to climb over. To, you know, it's 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 actually kind of difficult to travel through uh, areas like this. Okay, so you've seen this photo once before when we were talking about the borehole, but now we're going to focus on that left side wall. It is absolutely covered in thick gypsum hair and needles and general fuzz. Um, we, we started calling this the Yeti wall and because it looked, it looked fuzzy. It looked like you could pet it. <laughs> and, and we spent a while there taking pictures. It was, it was really hard to capture this particular formation, but these very talented guys did a great job of it. This is actually just a small portion of the group of gypsum needles and hair and beards. They're, they're covering this wall. And the rest of them stretch down the wall probably another 40 or 50 feet to the left. That's behind 
Stephen with the camera there. Here again um, is James' photo of, of Stephen taking a photo. Andrew is on the right and he's holding a flash um, to backlight me and the wall. And with Andrew and his flash just out of view behind the rock on the right, and a few other flashes set to, to light the front, Stephen was able to get this amazing final product that, that really represents this part of the formation quite well. It's, it's yet another super unique formation in Double Dopper Cave that I'm not sure has, has a, an equal anywhere else in the world. Excuse me, okay. So um, I wanted to put uh, this next photo in here to give you some perspective. Um, let me kind of give you a little bit of a layout here. We, we spent most of the, uh, the better part of a day photographing this particular area because there were so many unique parts to this passage. Uh, the Yeti wall is just a little ways past where it turns to black in the, in the back of the photo behind the two people. And then there's the borehole with the, you know, almost a trapezoidal feeling. As usual, there were mummified mammals in the passage, which I'll get to photos of soon. And then you reach this area near, you know, and above and behind the photographer, where you start to see formations that are very different from like the Yeti wall or the big borehole. This is kind of at the end of the borehole. We uh, we got into a differently decorated area with um, with large dry pool basins and uh, we started to see a lot more popcorn, specifically lots of popcorn covered stalactites and stalagmites and, and soda straws. And they were all dry, none of these were active. But there were there were odd spots like like this particular dry pool basin and where where some of the formations have have weathered in ways that you might not expect. Uh, the the floor here is littered with fallen soda straws and larger stalactites. Uh, just in front of James there, there's this weird combination of stalagmites of various sizes sort of stacked on top of each other. I really can't imagine, I can't explain to you how this came to be. It was it was difficult to even light it because <laughs> it's, it's such a funky shape. And, and it's this combination of formations that you can't, like, it's truly hard to get a good photo of. Um, perhaps, I mean, maybe that smaller one was a stalactite that fell down and stuck in the top of the stalagmite. I'm, I'm really not sure how this came to be. Once, once you got kind of lower, um, a lower view and, and looked up at it, you could see that, um, that there's sort of a flare at the top of the wider base of the formation. So that tells me that must have been there uh, when the pool was full, but I, I still don't know. <laughs> so, and then when you, when you looked closer at any of the walls, when you looked around, um, you know, we were focusing there on the, the formation in the, in the pool basin, but, but looking around at any of the other walls, you, you started to see sort of the intricacies and, and a larger variety of formations. Like here, um, we have gypsum needles and hair, and they're intermixed with aragonite. Um, some of the aragonite actually that's on the stalactite there is directional, which is an indication of, of airflow. It's, it's hard to describe just how decorated this place is because scenes like this cover every inch of the walls and ceiling. As we as we walked through the area, we we found one particularly delicate formation, and that's that's an understatement. <laughs> Hanging down in front of Stephen is a thread-like tangle of of gypsum hair. This thing really looks like like my hair got tangled, my long hair got tangled, and it was and it just stuck on the ceiling. It, but it was it was extremely hard to photograph. First, it's it's so lightweight and delicate that we couldn't even get too close to it or it would start to sway. It would even move if we, if we spoke 
too close to it or or moved past. So we tried to whisper and we had to move very slowly in the area. Every time I see these photos, it just it blows my mind how something like this can exist. It took lots of very slight tilting of the flash below to get the lighting just right and you know to get it to sh kind of pop in in front of a black background you can see how the, there are like separate pieces of the formation hanging off of others that are still attached to the ceiling almost like i don't know, think of it how how you would hang a candy cane on a on a string or on a branch excuse me or um or playing the game Barrel of Monkeys, uh, you know, these tiny curls are balanced over the hook-shaped parts. All right, so this is the last uh, sort of section, and I want to save it for all the mummified mammals that are found in the cave. Uh, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. Uh, I am going to show pictures of dead animals. If, if that's something you don't want to see, you can turn away for a little while. This uh, this fox here was discovered in in the borehole where the where the yeti wall and and that hanging string jumble are located. Like like the rest of the deceased mammals in Double Bopper Cave, it is very well preserved. We think this one one may have fallen from an upper level passage because there's a hole in the ceiling right above it where the fox died, um, but still not quite sure. Uh, here's the face. Um, actually starting to decay but but the ears and the fur and whiskers and, and even the nose are, are mostly intact those those soft parts are what you usually expect to decay first but you know here they are even even the pads of the feet make it look like like this fox could have just laid down here and died very recently but um, but we know that that's that's not the case to give you an idea of of the density of mummified animals in the cave, here are two that um, that died in very close proximity to each other. It's a, a fox on the right. Ooh, sorry, uh, slide advanced two, twice. Um, it was a fox on the right, and and a pack rat on the left. Uh, here's a close up of the fox. It's um, it's noticeably much more decomposed compared to the first fox that I showed. You can you can actually see bone on on the tail there and on the back leg, and uh, and its ears are are totally gone. The the rat that was just a few feet away was curled up in a tight little ball like like my hamster used to when I had a hamster when I was little. Uh, the these two are are in a dustier passage, and there was there was more iron foam in the area, so it you know not aerosolizes, but, you know, goes up into the air and creates these clouds. And, and the sediment, the sediments in the air cling to the fur and the whiskers. And that's what you can see kind of on the outside of the rat there. You can compare that to to other animals like, like this mouse, which was, which is found in a much cleaner, more decorated area. Uh, the tail here is, is just starting to dehydrate enough so that you can see some individual vertebrae. It would be so interesting to know the age of this little one. It it was so tiny and it it looks like, you know, maybe it isn't quite as old as the other critters, but we just we just don't know. We found uh another very well a few very well preserved rats on this most recent trip. This one uh this is actually a cell phone photo and but it came out so well that that you can see the, the split ends uh, at the ends of the the whiskers. It uh, another another really interesting thing we saw on this critter. You can see just just above its back left foot, there's there's a seed, and there's another one closer to the front foot. There are seeds stuck in this rat's fur. Uh, there are a few on this side, and and a few more seeds on the other side. You can you can imagine the knowledge that stands to be gained by by studying this animal and what's on it. If this is very old, um, say thousands and thousands of years, 
there, there may be a wealth of genetic knowledge preserved in those seeds, not to mention just in the ages of all these animals. Uh, so last I want to show just a, a few of the mummified bats found in the cave. One day uh, I was waiting for the sketcher to finish up a section of passage, so I took out my phone and, and started taking some quick pictures. I think this was actually the first day in the cave, and I was, I was trying to figure out my whether my phone could take decent photos in the cave. So I was moving around and taking a bunch of pictures of the same bat, and and I noticed uh, a light orange yellowish spot in the fur, and this arrow is pointing to that spot near the tail. I, I took a while trying to get the lighting and the focus on my phone to cooperate, and I finally got this photo of a bat fly. Uh, bat flies are ectoparasites, and they're specific to bats. Think about it like like we would get a tick. They they feed on the blood of mammals. Uh, another, this is just another really interesting find on a mummified creature that that may sometime someday lead to even more understanding of these animals' lives and and how they fit into evolutionary history. Next, this is a, a Townsend's big-eared bat that I think just fell off the wall right there. And, you know, the exact number of bats in Double Bopper Cave isn't known, but the numbers are significant, and and a, a large variety of species has been observed. Excuse me. The the majority of them are very well preserved, and this may represent a, just a great scientific resource. Uh, this next one's a, another little myotis bat um, with with some broken gypsum hairs on on top of it. This one uh, combined with some specimens that, that actually have gypsum formations growing around them on the wall lead us to believe that some of these bats are very, very old. There are also some bat skeletons that have been found, so those could be even older. This one's a, a large pallid bat that was still clinging to the wall with one foot, uh, and just, it's another example of another species found there. The the bats are generally found in sort of natural positions like this. Uh, they're either hanging on the wall or or lying on the ground, but almost always, you know, completely undisturbed. Oh, I love those long ears, and and I think the pallid bat's my favorite to find because of the the dark color and the big ears. Again, just um just hanging on the wall like like it should still be alive. Very intact and very well preserved. This is the last bat I have a photo of. It's um it's a hoary bat. Uh there are a few of these in the cave, which is very interesting because I'm told that hoary bats aren't known to use caves and much less be found so deep in a cave system. Uh, I I wanted to end the double bopper um, portion with this photo because I feel like it's such a great representation of double bopper cave. It's it's dry and dusty, and the gypsum flowers are just covering the floor, and then you have a you know perfectly preserved mummified bat. Okay, so that's what I have from inside double bopper cave, and. And I wanted to share with you a few photos from this Hippogriff Cave. Um, Hippogriff Cave is is a small cave in the area. It's it's a few thousand feet of mapped passages, but it has some really interesting features. Uh, one of them is this pool. Large pools are very rare in Grand Canyon caves. Like I said, it's it's super dry. And so the, the caves that like don't have a huge stream or river running through them, dumping out into the Colorado, um, are you know, they're they're dry. They don't have these big formation areas and you know active pools and dripping. And so so this was sort of an odd find. Um, James, the the photographer here, had initially set up to take a photo of the flowstone that I'm on right there or next to. But 
when its flash went off, these these crazy dark red lines were like burned into my vision. It was it was almost like lightning. And I said I said to, I said to him, did you see that? And he said, he was looking through his camera. Or he wasn't looking. He didn't he didn't see it. And he but then he looked at the photo in his camera screen, and we were both just blown away. We said, oh my gosh, you have to get a really good photo of that. And we spent a little more time there. Uh, looking at, at and photographing this feature in the ceiling that no, neither of us had seen until that flash went off. Uh, there's also this large borehole section in Hippogriff Cave. It's it's hard to grasp the the scale until you see me standing on that boulder near the center, and yeah, it's it's another I don't know another example of of Kind of the variety in this very small cave. Um, this is right next to to Double Dopper Cave, but they don't connect. Hippogriff Cave was was a little bit harder to get in and out of. It has a, a very small entrance at the back of of this this rock shelter, and then um, and to get down into here, there's a little bit more complicated vertical um, work to get down to it, and then. A larger J hang to actually get into the entrance. So, so um, we spent a day over here um, getting those photos, and and we also connected Hippogriff Cave to another small cave right next to it. Um, by uh, a few of the the climbers did a, a short climb, and we're able to to connect the two caves in an upper level passage. So, so that was a really neat day, um, and I I hold a special place in my heart for Hippogriff Cave because um, I was the first one to squeeze through a hole in the back that opened up into the bigger areas. So, um, so that was that was really fun to do two years ago and, and it was great to go back and, and to see the, um, the rest of what was discovered in the back there. All right, so I, I do need to thank the, um, the other photographers on this trip. I just had my GoPro and my cell phone, but um, but Stephen Egonoir and James Hunter are amazing photographers, and they carry all this extra weight to to bring to be able to bring these these pictures to other people that that weren't there to see it. Uh, I would not be able to give this presentation without their talent and support. Thanks also to the cartographers for giving me permission to show their maps. The cartographer for Double Bopper Cave is Stan Allison and the cartographer for Gryffindor Cave or that section is uh, is Paul Berger. So with, with that I would I would love to take any questions. I will do my best to answer them and I guess uh, Debbie's going to join us again um, for that section portion. <laughs> oh, okay, well awesome. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we do have um, a few questions people as you um, thank you, please put put them in here. Um, okay, let's see. We have um, Mark Langenfield. His question is twofold. It says map map network hypergenic um, spelogenesis agreed. Um, do you agree with that? That it suggests hypergenic spelogenesis. He said he wants uh, yes, to know I, if you you agree with that. Okay, and then he says yes, there I agree. Are, yes, okay. <laughs> that there are several um, nearby breccia pipes hosting uranium mineralization. Have the cave atmospheres been tested for unusual high concentrations of radon? So they have not. Did that's you guys actually? That's been sorry. Go ahead. You guys didn't have any air testing equipment. We did not. Um, uh, you know, I I thought that a couple of years ago somebody had mentioned that some of the the iron foam was being tested, uh, but mm -hmm. but other than that, uh, no, I don't. I don't believe there's there hasn't been much um, many scientific studies done in these caves uh, where where there really needs to be. I mean, there's there's such a wealth of knowledge waiting to, mm -hmm. to be studied. 
Um, any illnesses connected with uh, the red foam dust? Any what was connected? Sorry. Any illnesses that have been connected to the red foam dust? Oh no, no, um, nothing, nothing except for having very dark brown burgers for a few days. <laughs> but, but after that, uh, no, I mean it. It does sort of, it sort of stains your your skin and like survey paper, uh, and and clothes. I mean, actually, on this photo that's up right now, you can see. Uh, James is in the green jacket on the left of the flag, and he has his um, his white glove on, and you can see some of the some of the marks from it. But it, you know, it's not very much beyond just dirt. <laughs> after okay, after a few and <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Get back to <clears throat> okay. Um, Mark Turner wants to know if there's been any carbon dating on the mummified bats yet. So there hasn't been. Um, uh, we are there's there's um, there's some some samples have been taken, but uh, but we're waiting on uh, to hear about that. I believe um, something's in the works for for publication soon. Okay, awesome. Let's see. Mark said um, salt-based formations are the, is it sodium, Epsom, Epsomite, um, Myra is above me. <laughs> what type of <laughs> right, what type um, of salt-based? Right. So, um, so I was told um, they're mostly made of Epsomite and Mirabolite, which are probably two of the ones you listed. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the salt-based formations, I think Epsom, like Epsom salt, uh, Epsomite, mm -hmm. and and this other one, Mirabolite, and and yes, they were very salty. <laughs> okay. Um, any evidence of paleo-human occupancy at any time? Not in these caves. Um, there there are some I know in the Grand Canyon that have that have um, evidence of use by paleo humans but uh but no these these caves are located you know 200 feet off the ground and 200 feet down a cliff uh most of them are, well at least all of these in this area were not um not used by any any people or not that we saw it totally inaccessible um, totally inaccessible without um without ropes and and serious vertical gear Okay, and Bill still said that you did a great job. Thank you very much, but he just left. So Bill thought you thinks you're wonderful. All right, now, Paul Unger, um, what is the morphology of the cave? Um, you're going to have to help me out. <laughs> um, um, how how do you think it was what formed? Would I don't so, know. Uh, so you know some of it um i would i would say you know it's it's mostly water formed and then um and then actually there's some indication that water came down the from the rim and cut out the canyons and then you know opened up multiple entrances like pointing in each direction uh to these caves um which is, is a, it's kind of an interesting, uh, you know, geography, <laughs> interesting um, way to think about it, where is that the caves were formed and then, and then, you know, the same sort of Colorado River that cut through the Grand Canyon, uh, other tributaries came in and cut through and made the, the smaller side canyons. And as they did, did that they exposed these what weren't originally entrances to the cave but they were they're you know just a passage pointing each direction okay and our um nss president gary Schindel said thanks for the presentation it's a wonderful cave presentation and uh the great team of cavers 
So he, he thinks thanks this very is awesome. much. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Gary. All right, and Dave Bunnell says regarding the stalag the stalagmites in the dry pool that Beth found somewhere inaccessible, are these actually common pool phenomenon, especially um, in wetter caves? Uh, it's a big, long, long question. Do you want me to read the whole thing to you? <laughs> so I, I, I might have gotten it. Um, are you, you're talking about the um, the formation that was in the dry pool basin that had a smaller sort of formation sticking out the top, and uh, and is that type of formation common in wet caves, like active pools? And well, it is that, says is that the um, question? regarding this Sorry, regarding the stalagmite in the dry pool that Beth found somewhat inexplicable. These are actually common pool phenomena. Oh, he's saying they are common pool phenomena. Oh, he's saying they especially are. Especially in okay. wetter Great. caves. The stalagmites, um, let's see, the stalagmites on the bottom was in, inundated up to the level of the flare, which is a shell stone ring that grew as calcite rafts deposit on pool surface um, I, do, 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 um, it accrued over time it's also likely the straw grew in diameter below the pool surface due to um, accretion of spar crystals you can read about the shell stone on my virtual cave website for the new NSS book based on on it while you're there, check the pages of Gypsum Flowers and more images of Double Bopper. Great job, Beth. Thanks much for your nice work and updates on the recent addition to Double Bopper. So, awesome. awesome. Thanks. Another, I'll, another I'll definitely check that I'll out. I'll definitely look into that. And, uh, and yeah, thank you so much for, for contributing. That's, that's great to, to know. I've, I don't claim to know anything about spelaeogenesis or um, or formation forming other well, than you're the very doing, basics. You're doing so. You're doing a great job. Okay, and last question so far is um, Mark Turner says: Any ideas on the iron foam? Speculations on whether it has a biological or origin, like an iron floor floor flow current. This is where I need Gary to translate all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a rockologist, right? So, and, uh, uh, any idea whether what, what speculation were you guys on the iron foam? Have you heard anything about that? You know, from from what I've seen of it, it um, it does look somewhat biological. It's almost like a net uh, when you when you look at it before it collapses or you know, if there's a, a chunk of it sticking out from the floor, um, you know, untouched, it's, it is sort of like box work, like that, um, that network of, of connections of like sinews. Um, so I, I know a certain cave microbiologist that would say, of course, yes, it's definitely biological. It's, and, but, but I don't know that for sure. And, uh, Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, that's that's another good option for someone to look at very closely that 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 knows what they're looking at, and um, and there's there's plenty of it there to to study. <laughs> okay. Um, any any other questions for Beth that um, you'd like to bring up? And I know Gary Shundel on here. Gary's usually got some good explanations, um, but I haven't heard back to see if he wants to chime in on this. So, Gary, you have anything to say? No. All right. Any other questions and comments? Now, um, Gary says, never heard of the iron foam, but boy, it sure seems interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. It sure is. <laughs> um, um, it says, my guess is the iron foam um, is the iron foam was its own layer, um, but insoluble, 
So when layers below it dissolve, it fell to the ground. Do you see layers? Did you see any layers in the wall from Dave Beno? Um, no, I think it was pretty much on the floor. Um, no, I, I would. Oh gosh, I can't, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't remember any instance where it was at, at least not that thick on the on the walls and ceiling. Okay. Now here's a question I came up with, but then it it, it I answered it. Um, it says, um, with this being inac inaccessible to human, um, how would the red fox and the other animals get in the cave? And my thought is that there are probably small holes or small air air holes that they were able to climb down. Um, and, either and actually, either that or um, yeah, either either the air holes and they came down from from a, a higher level or um, or up from the canyon floor. There are there are some ledges, you know, things that that obviously people wouldn't be able to climb or or balance on or you know couldn't hold their weight, but uh, you know they could they could come up one side and go across the tiniest ledge across to the entrance um that that is one one theory um there is actually mm -hmm. one live mouse that we saw running running back and forth um near the entrance uh you know all i could think of was geez don't go any deeper in this cave you're gonna, you're not going to make it back <laughs> out little guy but uh but yeah i mean well, we if know you've that, ever that 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 makes sense especially if you look at like you see the mountain goats hanging the side of the mountains and how they get where they're going just utterly amazing and see how creatures can um scurry up the sides uh let's see gary says the cave warrants a, a lot of additional scientific study definitely so um mark says iron bacterial mats or iron fungal mats is what they might be uh, Jean Harrison said, awesome story and photos. Can you please consider posting some on the NSS web pages in the vertical section group? We'd love to see it. Uh, that's from Jean. Um, so um, hopefully you would. So, yeah, um, I mean, Debbie, if you want to uh, sort of coordinate that or, or at least um, get that person's information or contact information to me and I can I can talk to them about that. Uh, and getting the permission from the photographers and things like that. But um, yeah, just just um, if you want to pass along some contact information, then I can I can see what we can do uh, for what what she wants. Are you still there? Uh oh, I wonder if we either lost Debbie or um, if mine's no longer working. <laughs> I I can't tell. Uh, if if everybody can still hear me, you know, thanks again for for coming, and and yeah, I guess. Uh, oh, you're you're welcome to let Debbie know if you have any additional questions. I thought I just heard it. Yeah, there sorry, we go. For some w, reason, my phone just yeah. Some reason my oh. phone just crashed, and I have never seen it do that before. So, um, oh. I'm talking on the computer. Hope you can hear me. Um, sorry about that. That was just odd. Um, okay. It says, are you are there other exploration teams currently working on these caves and elsewhere in the canyon? Uh, yes. Yeah. There there are a lot of projects going on. Um, on both the north and south rim, uh, and and then also in some of the the stream caves, some of those uh, those caves that you know there's there's streams or rivers running through them, and and they they're closer to they're usually closer down towards the towards the Colorado River. Um, this is up a little bit higher in a in a layer that's a lot drier. Um, I think uh, one team is planning on going back to, to Double Bopper in the fall. There's um, 
like I said at the beginning, um, there's not as many huge leads, but um, but we're hoping that, you know, as this project wraps up, maybe something else will come up. Uh, I mean, like I said, this, this area, is, we only started surveying in this area, what, 23 years ago. Um, you know, the next 20 years could hold just as much and, and we're, we're looking forward to it. You know, we won't, we won't stop. <laughs> okay, another one says, um, is there evidence of active gypsum or calcite formation? Um, any speculation on the sulfur deposits? Uh, there are some areas with dripping water. Um, there's a particular area near the entrance that has a pretty active drip, and then um, that area with the with the cave pearl still has an active drip. Um, gypsum flowers. I I assume those are excuse me, those are all still very active. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, there's, there is one speculation um, as to why the, there's so many gypsum flowers, you know, so they're so dense in that one spot, um, or sorry, in the, in the entire cave, actually, or in a bunch of spots inside the cave, is that um, there's, there's almost 3,000 feet of overburden, uh, you know, of rock above this cave. So, I think of it like a tube of toothpaste. It is just, there is so much weight above this space in the rock that it's just squeezing it all out of the sides of the walls like like a tube of toothpaste. Um, so yeah, I, uh, there are a few active places that that, um, that hippogriff cave, which is, you know, right right next to, you know, in the, in the same little canyon as the, as the Gryffindor entrance to Double Bopper, it it has you know dripping and and uh, and surface moisture. It has a giant pool. So so yeah, uh, there are some still active uh, formation areas, but but they're not they're not the most common thing that you see in there. Okay. Um. Let's see. Uh, Larry and Cindy Spangler. Hi, Larry. Says um, another great presentation. Yep, you do great ones, Beth. People really love them. Um, this is a world-class cave. Are any of these mummified species still in existence in this area? And um, are they found in any of the other caves in the area? Uh, so there are a few active bat species in the area and obviously there's still gray foxes and, and um, pack rats and mice. Um, I, I know that um, there, are, there are a few bat species they've found in there that, that aren't known in the area currently. So, uh, so that's, you know, that's a, a super interesting find that, um, you know, there, there are mummified bats in, you know, deep in this cave that aren't currently found in the area. Um, yeah, I haven't, I couldn't tell you which, which species are yeah, which there's at still, the moment. still a whole lot of unknowns down there. There sure great are. Place, great place to get lots and lots and lots of research going. All right, well, we have kept you on for quite a while. Um, Beth, and you, you just do an awesome job. We. We really have a lot of people watch your webinar, that last one. And I know this second one, um, we had a uh, lot, a lot of people show up. And um, I know we're going to have a massive amount of um, downloads for your webinars. So hopefully um, you'll do part three sometime in the future because you seem to be very popular on this. You're doing a great job. I appreciate it. Um, so everybody, thank you for showing up. Beth, you're awesome. Um, oh, I do thank have one so question for you. Um, of course, yeah. The Cavers, is Andy Armstrong on this? Was he on this? Um, he trip? is. He's, um, I thought that he's was right his face on there. James and Robin, yeah, they're on the left. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. I thought that looked like him. And I kept wanting to ask and I forgot. <laughs> All right. Well, Beth, you are awesome. Thank you so much. And hopefully we will hear about you um, 
giving another webinar sometime soon. Um, you just you go to such amazing, interesting places, and hopefully, at convention, you'll um, give another presentation. Well, I so. hope that that um, you know the caves keep keep giving me some material there. <laughs> well, you go to lots of other great places. You got Lechiquia, and then uh, you were down at I just missed it, Snowy River. You were down there doing some great things. So um, mm -hmm. you have lots of adventures, and we'd like to hear about them. So um, All right, we'll take well. care of yourself, and thank you, thank you, thank you, and everybody. Please remember to go to the NSS website of caves.org and look under the webinar section. We have six years of webinars stored there. If you have any um, buddy that you know would be a good speaker or if you would be willing to do a presentation, please contact me and let me know. We're always looking for speakers. You don't have to be professional. You don't have to do you know, just a phenomenal job like Beth has done. Um, you can just be relaxed and have an informal webinar. Uh, let us know. We definitely like to hear from you. Um, but Beth, you are wonderful. Thank you so much, and you have um, you have a great week. All right, you too. Thank you. Okay, everybody, have a good night and cave safely.